Amen. Thank you, Sister Laura. Amen. Wow, I tell you, you can tell that God's people are glad to be back in God's house. Amen. 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 I <clears throat> didn't intentionally miss it, but it was so good to have Brother Don back this morning after the tremendous accident he had. It's good to have him back. and we're, uh, Keep praying for him. And keep praying for all of our folk, uh, uh, especially Cindy Weaver and the family. Keep praying for them and others this morning. Take your Bibles today, if you will, and open up to the book of Genesis. Some of you are going to hear from the pulpit now. God has been doing this recently. Uh, I'm going to have to call Brother Aaron and ask him what he's going to be teaching on so I can change my message. Or I'm going to have to call him and tell him, you're going to change yours. <laughs> One of the two. You'll be hearing some of the things that he brought out so eloquently this morning again, but it doesn't hurt you uh, in this day in which we live. But turn in Genesis chapter 1, if you will. We're going to begin reading with chapter 1, verse 26, if you have your Bibles. And then we're going to read a few other verses this morning. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, And God said, let us make man in our image, after <clears throat> in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the flesh of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created him. He, them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowls of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. I want you to notice where it says here, And God created he him, male and female, created he them. Uh, go to chapter 2, if you will, and we'll begin reading with chapter 2, verse 18, the Bible says. And the Bible, uh, uh, and the Lord said, it is good that man should, uh, it is not good that man should be alone. I'll make for him a helpmate to meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field, every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all the cattle, and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helpmate for him. Verse 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Let's go to chapter 3, if we will. I want you to notice in chapter 3, <clears throat> verse 20. Chapter 3, of Genesis 20. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And then chapter 4 and verse 1, it says, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived, and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. In these passages of Scripture, and I, <clears throat> I know this morning most of you here today are very familiar with these verses there, but I want to uh, submit to you this morning, we have the account of the establishment of marriage and the home as God intended for it to be. Right there. 
uh, on it. Uh, in these verses, you find what I call the formation of the home. And may I say, plainly as I can this morning, it should be today just exactly like it was when God established it. Can I have an amen on that? Amen. You see, what I'm trying to say this morning is, it ha this marriage and the home, in the eyes of Almighty God, has not changed, folks. In fact, I can prove that by the vacation of the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. If you got your Bibles and want to turn there real quickly, if you turn over to the uh, book of Mark, uh, let's just see what Jesus said. And, you, and I'm sure you're familiar with it as well. Mark chapter 10 and verse 6. Listen to this. Jesus put His approval, Jesus put His stamp upon God's plan for marriage and the home. And he did it here in Mark chapter 10, beginning with verse uh, 6. It says, uh, <clears throat> verse 5, let's look at verse 5. And Jesus answered and said unto them, For the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. That was, uh, they were talking, trying to trap Jesus and get him all caught up with the business of divorce and all this mess. And so Jesus said, look, I'm just going to set you guys straight. Here's how it is. Verse 6. From the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. And for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. And they twain shall be one flesh, so that they, they are no more twain, but one flesh. And then God, uh, Jesus puts a little addition to it. He says, what therefore God hath joined together, verse 9, let not man put asunder. I want you to notice here, the Bible uh, in Genesis, verified by the Lord Jesus Christ, when it comes to marriage and the home, it says one man and one woman. I need an amen. amen. One man and one woman. This has always been God's divine plan for the home. And I want to say again, it has not changed. It's still the same today as it always was, and anything that is a change of that is an abomination in the eyes of Almighty God. Amen. One man and one woman. You see, the uh, marriage is founded upon three things according to the Bible. That is... It's founded upon the husband and the father as the head of the home. It's founded upon the wife and the mother as the heart of the home. And it's founded upon the two having union together, having children, which is the happiness of the home. That's it. God himself established it. God himself put it in uh, practice. I could preach on each one of these this morning. The husband and the father. The wife and the mother and the children. But this being Mother's Day, I'm going to center my message around the heart. The heart of the home. The mother. And I'm going to preach this morning on <clears throat> the uh, fruits of a faithful mother. The fruits, I, I really want, I ought to title it like this, the fruits of a godly mother. I'm telling you this morning, I, now when I say mother, I, you know, we're, of course, or, or when we have Father's Day, I'm, I'm preaching uh, to all of us. And we need some old-fashioned, spirit-filled, God-loving moms and dads and children in this world today uh, as never before. Uh, uh, there. So I want to center my message around the heart. And I believe you agree with me this morning. No one deserves any more praise, any more glory than our precious mothers. Amen. I mean, they, they deserve all, that we, all the praise that we can do uh, there. Uh, and it's good to remember them. And that's what this day is all about. 
uh, our country set aside this day, that we have a special day that we especially remember our mothers on it. Now, let me say this. If your mother has passed on, you have precious memories, no doubt. And that's, and that's why I, I have precious memories of my mom. She and I were exceptionally close for some reason. Just exceptionally close. I miss her greatly. But if your parents or your mom is still living today, I w and you can, I encourage you in some way, call her, contact her, and tell her again you love her. Because I'm going to tell you right now from this pulpit, you won't have her around forever. And so it's a good time to share that how much you really love her and appreciate you. You see, down through history, <clears throat> there's been the testimony of a lot of good men to their success attributed to their moms. I jotted down a few here. Uh, one of them was in our uh, bulletin this morning, but uh, it was Abraham Lincoln. Now, these are direct quotes from uh, what they actually said. They weren't made up. Somewhere in their life, they made these statements concerning their mothers. Abraham Lincoln said, All that I am or can become, I owe to my angel mother. General Douglas MacArthur said, It was my sainted mother who taught me a devotion to God and to love my country. John Quincy Adams once said, All that I am, my mother made me. Charles Spurgeon, that great Baptist preacher, said this, I cannot tell how much I owe to the solemn words and prayers of my Christian mother. Dwight L. Moody, the great evangelist, the great preacher, he said, All that I've ever accomplished in life, I owe to my mother. And I could go on and on. There's a, a tremendous list of what would be called famous people that we have heard about, know about, read about. When asked about their success in life, they went back and said, I contribute, I am what I am because of my mother. But you know, it's the same in God's Word. You'll find as you turn to God's Word that there are some uh, testimonies of some great men of God who were successful and were used of God because of their mothers. The Bible bears that out. We're going to look at that this morning real quickly as we look into God's Word on this Mother's Day because there's some spiritual lessons that we can learn from these men that God chose, God picked, God called, but they, they went back and it was because of the influence of their mothers that God was able to use them like he did. What I'm trying to say, I guess, this morning is you cannot underestimate the powerful influence of a godly mother. Amen. Amen. You just can't do it. So I walk quickly this morning. Let's go into God's Word. Brother Aaron touched some of this this morning uh, there, but uh, on one, or at least one of them I'm going to point out. I could have picked out many. But I chose three great men of God whom were great enough that God put in the Bible that accomplished what they did for God because it was because of their mother. We'll show you that in just a moment uh, there. So the first one I want to reach into back history in the Bible this morning and call out to sort of examine this morning is a man you're well acquainted with and was well spoken of this morning in Bible class, but that's the man Moses. Now you find that Moses 
uh, was, you know the story. I, I, I think for the uh, uh, brevity of time, I will sort of bypass some of it. But Moses was a, the man that God chose to lead his people out of the bondage of Egypt into the promised land. Uh, there. And so you find that, you find this recorded uh, in, in uh, Exodus chapter 2, 1 and 10. I'll not turn your, I'll, I'll just kind of give you a synopsis of what this is all about again this morning. And then you find the record in Hebrews of the faith of Moses. And I, I've often asked the question, where did Moses' faith come from? Well, we're going to, uh, the answer is in Exodus chapter 2, verse 7 through 10. His faith was passed on to him by none other than his mother. That was brought out quite well in the Bible class this morning. There, you see. Uh, <clears throat> the Bible says that when... Uh, Moses was put in that little ark, put in that river to protect him from the slaughter of the babies by Pharaoh. That Pharaoh's daughter found him and Moses' sister was guarding over him in that little basket, a little ark there. And when Pharaoh's daughter found him, she said, he's one of the Hebrew babies. And Hebrew's sister came on the scene and said, would you like for uh, a, a, a lady to take care of him for you? She said, yeah, I would like that. And I just want to say this, there's no accidents with God. <laughs> I mean, that was pre-planned, pre-programmed. Uh, uh, Pharaoh's daughter turned the little baby Moses over to his own mother. And he, I don't know how old he was when he went back, to, uh, when uh, the, the daughter took him back. It, you, I'm just not going to read it. You can read it. The daughter, the daughter took him back. Uh, he was up in age. I don't know how old. But by the time that his sister had took him to the mother, and the mother had taken him, uh, uh, given him back to Pharaoh's daughter, during that time, the Bible uses this term, she nursed him. She watched over him. And you can rest assured, she taught him. So Moses was a result of a godly mother's teaching. And so when the time came for God to use him, he had been well instructed on his Jewish history. And the Bible says, I believe Brother Aaron read it this morning in Hebrews, that he being, being instructed by his mother, he had sat under his mother's teaching, uh, 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 perhaps on his mama's lap. And she went over the scriptures and over the teaching of God's people, why they were in Egypt and who they were, and that they were God's people. And because of her teaching, it says in Hebrews, he chose to serve God rather than the pleasures of Egypt. Amen. Had he not been taught by his mother, I almost guarantee you, he would have grown up and eventually he would have become a Pharaoh of Egypt. But it was because of his mother's teaching that he was able that it, to have that record in Hebrews. That it said, I choose God over the riches and the pleasures of Egypt. What I'm getting at this morning is this. We need to have, I believe as never before in America, we need to have some godly mothers that will teach their children some things. Let me quickly, what I believe, I could be wrong, but I got three things I believe we, we need to teach our children. And especially the moms. So I said, well, why put all the uh, burden on the mothers? Well, you can say what you want. There may be exceptions. 
But I, it's the mother who has the children most. It's the mother who spends most time with, it, with them, especially in the early years. It's the mother from which most of them, hear me now, it's the mother from whom most of them get their teaching. And that's a great responsibility. Amen. Amen. What, would, what should they be taught? Let me give you what I think we ought to teach our children. I know many things. I know that. But I believe there's three things you can sum it up that we need to teach our children. And, and for the most part, they're not being taught. Number one, we need to teach them reverence for God. Oh, listen. Children need to be taught about the holiness and the righteousness of God. They need to be taught that His Word is pure and, uh, and, uh, and His Word. They need to be taught His Word is to be obeyed. They need to be taught they need to worship Him and serve Him and to love Him. Jesus said, love the Lord thy God with what? All thy heart. Folks, I'm telling you, I, I, in America, we have lost our reverence for God. You see, if what have we? What do we lose it? We lose it one generation at a time. The Bible says that. If one generation does not teach another generation, that generation will not have anything to stand upon because they will not have heard the truth. We have an obligation to teach our children a reverence for God. And we've lost that in America. Oh, I tell you, I don't have to preach on that. You know it so. There, there's very little reverence for who God is and what God stands for. Because if, they, if, we had, if we believed that, we'd be, there'd be a lot of things changed in America. Amen. We need to teach them reverence for God. Number two, we need to teach them the respect for authority. Here's another thing we lost. And that, this includes three things. This includes authority for their parents. Uh, you can say what you want. We've, uh, we've lost that mostly. At least my experience with it. I go, in, I go in homes where there's little kids running around and I see what's going on. And uh, I've been there where whatever the, the little brat's doing, you know. <laughs> right, oh, Johnny, you stop that. Johnny, I told you to quit that. Johnny, no, you're not supposed to do that. My dad said one time, and that would have done. They need to be taught authority, not only in the home, they need to be taught authority of the laws of the land. Amen. They need to be taught to obey. The, I don't like the law. Then do something to change it. There's a lot of these laws I don't like. But Brother Aaron read this morning from Romans. We are to be in subjection to those who are in authority over us. If it's, if it's in the will of God. You brought that out very well. But that's authority. Not only this, we need to teach children to be respectful of those, of those positions, of the positions of those that are in authority. Amen. Amen. Ah, I don't like him. You don't have to like him. If he's, if he's in a particular position, and it's a position of respect, you may not respect the man, but you need to respect the position. Amen. That goes for president. That goes for pastors. I'm telling you, the reason we've got such, uh, I don't know what it is today, uh, in many of our churches, breaks my heart. But it's disrespect for the divine authority that God has set up for His church and for the pastor God's put over them. 
And a lot of the children do not have respect for that today. That's right. And you know why they don't have respect for that today? Mom and dad don't have respect for that today. We need to teach them reverence for God. We need to teach them respect for authority. But one other thing I believe is missing. We need to teach them responsibility for their actions. Boy, we're missing that. Children ought to be taught this, that there is accountability for what they do. Whether it's right or wrong, be that whatever it may be, but you're going to give an account for every choice you make. You make a bad choice, you're going to give an account for it. You make a good choice, the accounting's a little bit different than that. But you're going to count. You see, what I'm saying is this. There is consequences for every decision you make. What's behind all of this? Have you thought about it? What's behind all this rioting and... and uh, uh, burning of property and, and destroying things uh, uh, and violence in, our, in America today. What's behind it? You, you may believe something else. I believe it's a disrespect for authority. They can get away with it and therefore they do it. Oh, how we need some godly moms and dads who will take the responsibility of teaching their children. Because I want to say this this morning. If mom and dad doesn't teach them, somebody else will. Mark it down. Hollywood will. If you don't, the internet will. If you don't, the world out here will. If you don't, somebody they're going to get their teaching and training from someone. So I know says, let the church do it. No, the tra- training and teaching ought to come from the home, and the church then ought to enforce that training and that teaching. Don't lay it upon the back of the church to to teach your kids. God laid that upon the responsibility of the mom and dad. Amen. We're here to reinforce that. We're here to try to help in that regard. We're here to try to preach right and be against the wrong. But if they don't get it at home... They're not going to get it. Moses was a product of a godly mother's teaching. Let me quickly hasten on. There's another one, great prophet of God. And I I just can't read all these scriptures because of the brevity of time. But there's a great prophet of God by the name of Samuel who was a product of a, a godly mother's tears. You know the story again. First Samuel 1, verse 1 through 28. There was a, a lady by the name uh, uh, Hannah. By, uh, was a wife of a man by the name of Elkanah. And Hannah had no children. The Bible says God closed her up, up her womb. I do not know why. I have, no, I have none of my business. But God had done that. And quickly, I'll go over the story. You know it, I'm sure. But she, she, for, for a, a number of years, she begged and pleaded and, 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 and desired that she have a child. She would go to the temple and she would weep and, and pray and, and, and agonize to God, give me a child. And one day, the old priest said, God's going to hear your prayer. And she said, if God will just give me a child, I will give him back to God. 
He made a vow. I'll give him back to God. And lo and behold, God gave her a child. She named him Samuel. And the Bible says she took him back to the temple and she gave him back to God as she said she would. And he became one of the most famous prophets of that era. Samuel. We all know of him there. on it. But Samuel became that prophet because of the tears of that mother. I wish I had time. I could give you three things. I'll, I'm, I'll, I'll not preach on them. I've got them here. I'll give you three things about Hannah that every mother ought to try to follow. I'll give it to you in, by the verses. First of all, you see her desire for children. Verse 10 and verse 15. In case I didn't give you the scripture, uh, you find uh, it's 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1 through 28. In verse 10 and verse 15, you find she desired, as I said a moment ago, she desired above all things that God give her a child. That was her desire. That's what she wanted. I've read that and I've read it many times. But it really begins to hit home when I look upon the day we're living in now. Because there's so many women today who do not want any children. You know? There are many married or unmarried women who do not want any children. And hear me this morning, it's been mentioned before. But there are umpteen thousands of uh, today who are guilty of murdering their unborn babies because simply they did not want them because it might interfere with their lifestyle. Amen. The liberals this planned whatever it is planned parenthood I guess you call it who kill and slaughter Thousands of babies, oh, of course, every year, I don't know how many, you can find out. But I want to say this, one day, they're going to face the judgment of God because that is murder, no matter how you look at it. Did you know, I'll, I'll take my stand on this. Maybe not everyone, maybe, I don't know, but I do, I'm pretty positive. Every little baby that's murdered in and even out of the womb, unborn, there would have been some family that would have taken that little baby. Yeah, that's right. If, so, if that's they didn't right. want it. Oh, what I'm trying to say is we need some mothers. Who love their children and want their children. Cherish their children. Did you know? Again, you may disagree. But I believe every child born to a lady or a mother is God's gift. Amen. Amen. You notice her desire. Notice something else about her in verse 15. You notice her devotion. She was a woman of, 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 who was devoted to God. How do you know that? Talks about her faith, her prayers, her crying out unto God. It says she poured her soul out unto God. How many mothers pray daily today? And listen to me. I'm not talking about praying for a 2 and 3 and 4 and 15 year old. I'm talking about praying for that little baby that God's given you that you hold in your arm. Amen. Notice in verse 11 her dedication. 
<clears throat> now, I thank God for the parents that do this. A lot of folks, a lot of parents don't. But I thank God for the parents that do. She dedicated that child to the Lord God. That's why we have dedications around here. They're not baptism. You're not talking about baptism. We're talking about dedicating the child. But did you know this? I think this needs to be said online because it goes out. Maybe someone listening who's not uh, doesn't know anything about it or not in church enough to know about it. Dedication is not so much for the baby. Dedication is for the mom and dad. That little baby, that doesn't, it don't mean a whole lot to that baby. That dedication is to the mom and dad. We will raise them in the nurture and admonition of God. Amen. That could be why a lot of people don't want to do it. But I thank God for the ones that do. And not only do, but follow through. She followed through. She said, I will give him back to God. And lo and behold, she brought him back to the temple and gave him to the priest. She said, I give him to God. A lot of preachers today, good fundamental Bible believing the Baptist preachers, can go back and say, I am where I am today because my mom prayed and watched over me and cared for me. Amen? Amen. Amen? Oh, we need some mothers of devotion, but I'll close. There's another guy I will call out of the eons of time. You know him. He was a young man whose faith was because of the testimony of a godly mother. His name was Timothy. Second Timothy 1, 1 through 9, you'll find the account there. Paul, uh, Paul chose Timothy to be sort of what he called his son in the ministry. Paul sort of took him under his wing. Paul helped appoint him to be the pastor at Ephesus. But Paul made a statement there in Second Timothy. He said it was because of the faith of your mother, Eunice, and your grandmother. In other words, Tim, uh, Timothy was what he was because of the testimony of, her, of his mom and his grandmother. Well, you know where I'm going. But it's a good thing to wind down upon. We need some moms and dads who give a good testimony that the children see. Amen. Oh, listen to me. That's why it's so important. We don't have a lot of young families in Berea. I, I, I pray God one day will give us many, many more that have a lot of children. We've got, we got some grandparents. And we've got some parents. And they may not be here this morning, but I hope some of them are listening. Because I want to nail this down. Your children are watching your testimony. Amen. And parents that consistently, constantly hit and miss coming to church because they've got something else to do or the world's got something else for them. Let me say this to you, even out there if you're listening in. If that's your attitude toward the house of God and toward God, you can mark it down. Sooner or later, your children is going to have the same attitude. 
And they'll grow up with the same philosophy. I can take it or leave it. And most of the time they leave it. And let me say something. Most of the time those children, they're the, they, they're the ones that give them the most trouble. Because they have seen the inconsistency of mom and dad. That the church, the Lord, the Word doesn't mean a whole lot. If it's convenient, I'll go. If it's not, I won't. If it doesn't rain, I will. If it does, I won't. Let me tell you something, dear ones. Young people, listen to more of what you do than what you say. Amen. It was Timothy's mother and grandmother's testimony that caused Paul to recognize in him that there was a godliness and a faith that God could use. And God called him. And he was a companion to, to Paul until he took the pastor to Ephesus. And then <laughs> Paul had to or, uh, try to, uh, he took a tough church. Boy, it was, it was a toughie. And Paul would have to write to him. That's what First and Second Timothy is all about. Stay in there. Fight the fight. Give it everything you got. But he was where he was. He did what he did. Because he had a mother and a grandmother whose testimony was their faith in God. Right. Oh my. How in this day and age, this so called modernistic, <laughs> enlightened, I don't know what, a, what a way to call it, enlightened age. I close with this. God give us some godly mothers who will teach their children. Give us some godly mothers who will shed some tears and concern over their children. Give us some godly mothers who are living a good testimony before their children. Because I say to you this morning, we must recapture God's plan and God's program for the home if America is to survive. Someone said this, as goes the home, goes the church. As goes the church, goes the nation. Amen. Did you get the sequence? As goes the home, goes the church. As goes the church, goes the nation. Amen. Let's stand together this morning. <laughs> every head bowed and every eye closed. Maybe you're out there and internet land, whatever you call it. Maybe you're here this morning. Maybe your children are grown, such as mine and Betty's are and others. Maybe you have some young grandchildren in your family somewhere, someplace. Maybe you right now, maybe you have a mother you need to call and say, I love you. You know, Mother's Day would be a good day for all of us to review our commitment to Jesus Christ. 
folks, I don't know how to, I just, I don't know how, how to put it. I don't know how to get it across. If God's people are not consistent, God's people are not faithful, how can we influence? How can we influence anyone else? By giving a testimony, it, it's not important to us. Oh, how we need some moms and dads, some husbands and wives. God help us. We need to look at ourselves and see. I know that I've failed so much as a many times. I, I look I, as a father. I'm, I'm fallen so short. As a husband, I have messed up so many times. As a pastor, I've made a lot of mistakes. I want to renew myself to God this morning. Oh, God, please, forgive me, help me, strengthen me. I want to thank you, God, Father Jesus, for my precious mother that you gave me all those years. precious they are I thank you for my wife I sometimes don't act it but without her I would be nothing God forgive me for not sharing that more I want my heart to be clean on this Mother's Day to start afresh and anew on this day we resume services at the church and Lord I pray this morning if there's anyone here that needs to rededicate their devotion their dedication to the Lord Jesus not to me not to the church but to Jesus Oh, Holy Spirit, please speak to them this morning. I confess, Lord, I need you this morning. I want to be a better father. I want to be a better husband. I want to be a better pastor. I want to be a better preacher. I know I'll, I'll flub up. But my desire is, Lord, I want to. I ask you to forgive me publicly this morning. I ask you to speak to any heart here today that needs to do something for God. Maybe there's a father, a mother, a grandfather, a grandmother here this morning that just needs to come to this altar and have a little talk with Jesus. I'm not going to beg them. I'm just going to let say, Lord, you speak to what you want done. In Jesus' name, amen. One or two verses, Brother Harry. Two verses. 232. 232. 332.